Okay, hello everyone. I am Daniel Heft. I am the chair of the Engineering for Food and Drinks Special Interest Group here at the Institution of Agriculture Engineers. Um, my background is in food processing, and today we have a little Africa special. Um, we will have two speakers on our program. First speaker up will be uh, Professor Charles Adetonji from Edo University, Iamo, followed by Professor Abalaka from the Federal University of Technology, MENA. Um, just one thing um, before we, or two things before we start. Number one, and um, for everyone who joined directly through the Zoom link and not uh, using the Eventbrite registration because I know a couple of people had um, problems signing up um, like just an hour before the event started. I dropped a message in the chat, the very first message, and um, please send me an email with your contact details so including your name and your affiliation, and then I will create the attendance certificate um, this way. The second thing is if you have any questions after the talks, um, just drop that question in the chat box and then we will manage it from there. Um, I am accompanied today by our CEO, Charlie Nicklin, and our first speaker, up, as I said, will be Charles Adetonji talking about food safety and nutritional value of fermented and indigenous dairy drinks to Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa. Charles is an associate professor in the microbiology department at Edo University, Iyamo in Nigeria. He is also presently the director of intellectual properties and technology transfer, as well as the chairman um, of the Committee on Research Grants at Edo University. Um, he has won several scientific award, awards and grants from renowned academic bodies like the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, India, or the Department of Biotechnology, India, and so on. Um, he also had recently a travel fellowship with the Royal Academy of Engineering UK. He has filed several scientific patents and has published more than 180 scientific in more than 180 scientific journals, books, um, conference proceedings, and so on. A few of them I had actually the pleasure to publish together with them and work with them. Um, the breadth of his scholarly contribution to research is evident from his contributions. Just look him up on Google Scholar or ResearchGate and so on. He covers basically topics relating to food security, agriculture, environmental sustainability, uh, microbiology, biotechnology, post harvest management, and nanotechnology. Um, and over to you, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, greetings to all of our to all people all over the world. It's nice connecting to you once again. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to be on this platform, connecting to a wider audience, scientists, researchers, students, and the policy and governments uh, in this kind of a webinar series. And especially before my presentation, I would like to thank the Institution of Agricultural Engineering in UK for this great platform for us to disseminate uh, knowledge and gain and a platform to learn from each other. So I would say that this morning, I'll be talking on food safety and nutritional values of fermented and indigenous drinks, dairy drinks to Nigerian and sub saharan Africa. As Daniel have stated before this presentation, I'm presently the acting director of intellectual property and technology transfer. And I double as the as an associate professor of biotechnology and microbiology. And in Nigeria, I am the zona coordinator of Southwest uh, Microbiology Society of Nigeria. Now, fermented milk in the global markets present a kind of opportunity and a kind of portals which has been uh, stated in the year, for the year 2019 to 2016, to be a kind of food that we are going to rely on. Because the world and the global population have been forecasted to increase drastically. Now, we are in the era of pandemic. People are going through a lot of stress, a lot of health challenges. Now, we need to now fall back on what is available in terms of local context in resolving 
the global challenges. So global fermenter make pause as a kind of sustainable tools that could help. And this has been forecasted to reach 397 billion by the year 2020, 2026, and which is going at at the, at the rate of 5.0%, which will range between the year 2019 to 2016. Now let's see the global milk production, how they produce milk in terms of uh, species from different animals. Katu has been uh, recorded to produce the largest amount of global milk production, which constitutes around 83%, followed by buffalo, 14%, goats represent 2%, sheep 1%, and camel 0%. So I will say that we understand that uh, what is uh, fermented food? Fermented food are rich ancient tradition that are used as a kind of supplement to fight against and boost our immunity. So the product symbolizes one category that is widely consumed and they contribute to social economy development and food security of many people around the globe. Most especially uh, people from Africa and Nigeria in particular. And this might be linked to the fact that the process involved is very cheap, which they use in producing all these fermented dairy products, the processing, which now often, because the process is very cheap, has formed a kind of stable system that could enhance the shelf life of food. And it serves as food safety and nutrition. And there, it could improve all level of micronutrients and serve as a probiotic. Now, numerous African fermented dairy food looks like a yogurt and they are produced spontaneously through the process of fermentation. So these fermented dairy products above a lot of beneficial microorganisms. We constitute a kind of microbiome that maintains the balance of our well-being. And many of them are dominated by lacto, uh, lactic acid bacteria and some yeast also. Now, in African context, fermentation of food is one of the oldest methods and technology that we use in preserving our food. Apart from dairy, we have the local staple food like gari, fufu, and some other one. But in this context, we are talking about fermented drinks. So from ages, it has been. Now, with proper research and development, probiotics from indigenous fermented dairy food could be used as a kind of directory uh, interventions that could help to mitigate a lot of diseases, including COVID-19, that the whole world is suffering from presently. So I will be dedicating a section to COVID-19. So agenda for today is that I'm going to present a detailed information on Africa, the usefulness of traditional Africa fermented dairy processing technology, technologically relevant microorganisms. I will be telling us some of those microorganisms that are found inside a fermented products in Africa and Sub-Saharan globality. Now, I'll be talking about health benefits that are associated with these dairy products. Then functional foods from this fermented food, how they could control some health challenges. Many of us have this dairy in our hand, but we don't know the benefits. So today's lecture is going to give a kind of overview that will open our eyes, that we have the medicine around us and we have the solution around us. Now, I will say that in many countries in Africa, milk have been a significant economic and dietary role for centuries, most especially in most Northern region of each country. For example, North Africa, the uh, Sudan Savannah region, like Senegal, Gambia, Mali, Burkina Faso, and northern territories of some countries like Guinea, Bolivia, Ghana, Togo, Bini, and Gambia, and some east part of East Africa. Now, indigenous and nomadic tribes are always engaged in this kind of business, which we call them Fulani. And presently in Nigeria, now we are going to a lot of challenges as a result of Fulani helps me. But I'm not going to that today. We are talking about the food and how it can help the society to resolve the global challenges. Now, some of these uh, nomadic tribes include the Fulani, 
the Maasai, the Tuareg, the Boran, and a lot of them, they consume milk. And people often discover that majority of these uh, S-men, Fulani S-men, they don't sick. They are heavy, they don't go to hospital. Now, today, we go to open our eyes. What do they used to consume? What are the eggs? Probiotic benefits and benefit related with why they don't seek often. Now, we might link a uh, all this to a lot of factors. There is a lot of challenges. Let's see the problem statements about uh, fermented dairy products in Africa and sub Saharan Africa. Now, due to climatic changes that might affect uh, the pasture and a lot of uh, green pasture where the cattle feed on. It will affect the growth of cattle and a lot of other animals. The low income uh, commercial production have not been established in most of these developing Africa and it's going at a very low pace. Now, meat constitutes a lot of protein, thereby we depend on. Now, when you're talking about per capita consumption in Africa, it's still about 30 liters per year, compared to the global average of 214 liter per year, according to FAO. Now, the low level of production and consumption of milk could hinder the diversification and development of uh, dairy product in Africa. Now, the issue of uh, climatic that is not stable, like the climate change in the warm climate, also make it a challenging uh, to preserve highly perishable foods or products of these dairy products. So, particularly in resource communities that lack necessary preservation, storage, and chilling techniques and modify or control or regulated uh, storage conditions. Now, let's not see fermentation as a uh, processing technology in Africa. Now, this technology has come to stay. It has been from our forefather and majorly they use a uh, milk from animal, as we have said, but uh, feel Food processes still has a major value of providing nutritious diets that could serve as preservation and generation of wealth. So in Africa in general, fermentation of food is one of the oldest methods that I've said that is used in processing of food and preservation of fermented food. Now, fermented milk product from Africa, let's talk about it. It's one of the old, century old indigenous fermented dairy products that is being consumed every day because it's formed the basis, a kind of nutrient, key nutrients. And many people are key, they have key into it as their major form of business. So African fermented dairy products are predominantly uh, accepted, widely accepted as yogurt or yogurt food or beverages. But depending on country or local or region or geographical uh, location, these fermented dairy products uh, doubles as a kind of a uh, same production method. Uh, they use the same techniques in their production. So you can see from this picture, uh, instead of having a bio reactor, a tank in a developed country, these are some of the container we use in Africa as a kind of fermentation uh, technology. These are our own vessel that we use, the local farmer, the local uh, producer use instead of, uh, so you can see now, producing a mix from this. A major challenge is how you produce, how will you store, how will you ensure the nutritivity, the stability, the bulk component, the phytochemical constituents present. Now, this kind of storage could not produce. So let's go ahead. Interesting part about fermenting this that we need to know about uh, from Africa. Generally fermented food in Africa, of course, spontaneously, and every household take it after their meal. In Nigeria, they call it as Masi in South Africa, Madilin in Botswana, and they are being produced on a large scale, just like in India, that people take a uh, milk, a yogurt, after each meal. So same in Africa context and some other part of the world. So during the spontaneous fermentation, it occur and microorganism. Uh, play a crucial role on raw milk and provide a kind of micro environment and form a diversity to enhance the raw products to become better. Now, during the production of fermented food in Africa, we must know milk sometimes can be mixed with a lot of other 
uh, stable food like cereals, most especially they use in weaning babies, baby that are coming up so that they can develop more resistance to pathogens and they can become more stronger. So they use all other grains in supporting them and so many other things like fruits and other uh, stuff like that. So country of origin where we have fermented dairy food products, I'm going to talk about them. In Kenya, we call it Amberi. In South Africa, it's called Amasi, uh, Ethiopia Ergo. So you can see the map, uh, Itri in Ethiopia, Crypto in Rwanda, Kulenato in Kenya, Kebnek in Uganda, Liban in Nigeria, um, Liban in North Africa, Masri, and a lot of other ones. In Nigeria, we call it Nuno, or some people say Nunu de Fura, or Fura de Nuno, depending. So you can see that Africa is blessed with this natural product. It's our thing. We take pride in it because of all the health benefits and it made it form a major source of income. So you can see the distribution. So another thing we need to know about the fermented dairy product is that uh, we have different kind of uh, material that we use in sourcing the material. Like yesterday talk, we saw a lot of cow and how milking is being done. Now, in Nigeria and all this Africa, they use ant in making the cow, from uh, getting the milk from the cow. And these are the container that they use. Instead of more sophisticated standardized equipment, we use uh, this kind of uh, container to collect uh, this product to form uh, all the fermented products. So also you can see the diversity. So when we are talking in this context, the role of the geographic location, type of animal in each environment, uh, relationship, ethnicity, uh, gender distribution, play a lot of crucial role in uh, development of fermented role. You can see a lot of container that look like a spoon that we use in eating this fermented product. You can see how the milk is being uh, obtained from the buffalo, uh, most especially by the Namibian tribes, Utasikatu. You can see several available material that we have here. They are ready to consume products, ready to consume uh, drinks, and plastic and calabash materials that we use in collecting this product. So this is Nora Denunu from the first slide. And also, we could derive meat from this fermented product, we will call cheese in most part of the world. And in Nigeria, it's called wara, most especially from the Yoruba region. We call it wara. And we use it in making our meat. Sometimes we fry it, we dry it. In fact, if you take it, you won't find a difference between this uh, fermented product and meat. So we are comfortable. And when you check the biochemical constituents and the nutritional competence, it formed the same composition with meat. So if all these natural available bio resources are kicked into, most especially by the developed country, we could package it, rebrand it, bring internet of a thing, artificial intelligence of a thing, smart technology, bio sensor into it to make it more durable in terms of storage and post-harvest context. You could see it could hit the international market and it could bring a very high gross domestic products and each country could be more economic stable. Now we are talking about circular economy. Now we need to digress from the linear economy to the circular economy. These are the bio resources. These are the bio products we need to kick into. Now, the issue of COVID-19 now have stimulated all of us that instead of importing beef can, now we go back and fall back to our available raw resources, which is uh, water. No, no, that's have the same composition like meat. So you can see in among the most uh, important targets group in each country, the students, most especially the primary school and the uh, secondary school cause, uh, need a lot of nutrition to make them grow and develop a very high resistance to disease. You can see students from Africa, most of them are being sponsored by local governments uh, so that they could get more. So let me quickly diversify and go straight to how these fermented food have been produced. Now, it has a lot of, uh, it depending on the products, like I've told you and I've shared 
uh, each product from each geographical location. So now I'm going to pick the one from Nigeria. Sorry, I'm not biased. Some like uh, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Sudan, Cameroon, Lesotho, Mozambique have the same modes of preparation of the fermented products. That's what I'm going to talk about. There. So the first thing is for you to get your fresh milk, sieve or pita it to remove the clog or some other particle that might adventure into the uh, milk. Then the raw milk is being pasteurized. Then you go to the process of fermentation. The process of fermentation differs. You can use your previous milk of a day old that has not been contaminated by microorganisms as a kind of starting culture that could help to upgrade and facilitate and fast track the process of fermentation. So from there, fermentations go on and it form your different products like Nono, Kulenato, Susi, Itui, and a lot of other products, Mafi in Lesotho, and Masse in Mozambique, in Cameroon, they call it Kindumo, uh, Rwanda, they call it Kuguto, Sudan, they call it Gazi, Makmo in Uganda, and uh, Kituenik in Uganda, and Itu in Ethiopia, Sozik in Kenya, and a lot of other beautiful, beautiful products, which shows Africa is blessed with a lot of bio resources and bio products. Now, when we are talking about fermented products, as a food, as a professor of food microbiology, over years, I've discovered that uh, microbiology has come to play a lot of role in this fermented product because most of these uh, microbota, microbaham, uh, produce a lot of influence by enhancing the quality, the safety, and the general product of this fermented product. Now, so microorganisms form a very good and a key role. Now, one of the most important globally, whether Africa, in UK, in UC, US, Australia, and any part of the world, one of the most significant that is very, very crucial in fermentation that you always find in fermented products is lactic acid bacteria or some other yeast. Now, I'm going to talk about lactic acid bacteria uh, that has been reported by several professors, scientists, students all over Africa from fermented dairy products. So from this table, it summarizes a lot of products and a lot of microorganisms that have been characterized using the molecular techniques, the cultural technique, fingerprint, and a lot of other crucial techniques like 16 RNA, uh, 18 RNA, to characterize this organism. And many of them have been stored at National Center of Biotechnology Institute, whereby we have a repository, the general of all kinds of microorganisms and the role of bioinformatics, chemoinformatics, informatics, genomics, Protomics are also helped in identification of all these beautiful strains that will enhance uh, the production of uh, things. Now, let's quickly go to the food and health application of dairy products. Number one, you can see a farmer, like I said, they use a kind of container in getting the milk. Now, the nutritional composition, it forms a kind of source of lipid, protein, amino acid, vitamins, and hormone, hemoglobin, growth factor, cytokinin, and a lot of peptides that could help the body, and a lot of vitamins, most especially vitamin B12 and B5. Now, lactic acid bacteria could also enhance the protolytic activity of milk, which results in quick release of free amino acids. Free amino acid is the main thing present inside protein that we undergo a lot of process before we could get. But to the action of lattice acid bacteria, it facilitates an easy and quick release of free amino acid. So you could see the benefits and a lot of other more. When you are talking in terms of micronutrients, they are there like calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and uh, a lot of other things like antioxidants. And because they are a kind of high activity and biological activity, phytochemicals, constituents, they could even go as far as lowering blood sugar. So you can see from here, from cow, now let's find the kind of deviation. How do they vary? Somebody can be asking, how do you now vary within various animals? When you're talking about cat, 
cow is very high. You can see the distribution, camel and goat. You can see the distribution there. So in, I made distribution in terms of water, protein, total fat, lactose, ash. So majorly you can see from the presentation that the major constituent that is present in the milk is ash. I tell you did in a proximate analysis. And protein, you find them in uh, some good amount. Now, there is a substance that is called bacteriozine I want to talk about, which form a kind of antibiotics from lactic acid bacteria. Now, the whole world is talking about antibiotic resistance and multi, uh, multi resistance activity in microorganisms. So it has become a global challenge for us to find a kind of sustainable tools. Now we can see from the fermented product, we have an antibiotics that could be used in curing a lot of uh, these global resistance from microorganisms. So they could help in mitigating several diseases and a lot of other stuff that may be present. So I've talked about the peptides, I'm not going to repeat it. So some of these bioactive compounds include leptin, oligosaccharides, antimicrobials, uh, immunoglobin, among many, and a lot of other good uh, biological activity. Some of them can serve as anti-cancer, they can serve as anti-diabetes, and a lot of many more advantages I might not be able to talk about. Now, this table is showing a lot of uh, bioactive peptides. That are, that are present in fermented dairy products. And uh, if you have the time, you can go through, you can scroll through, and uh, you'll get a lot of more information. So can dairy products now serve as a bio probiotics? Yes, yes, yes. This has been established in a lot of clinical trials because it could reduce cholesterol, uh, level, reduce level of plasma in ammonia in patients, and hepatitis encephalitis uh, are patient. And it could help in fighting a lot of degenerative disease and uh, a lot of communicable and non communicable disease. Now, let's quickly see the mechanism of action of probiotics, which is serving as a drug. Now, they could help in engulfing pathogens by producing a kind of uh, slime that could inactivate the biological activity of pathogen that are responsible for several diseases. They can antagonize this pathogen by producing this biocin. This biocin possesses a kind of arrow, a kind of spear, a kind of knife that could break the cell walls of this pathogenic microorganism, whereby lysing the RNA, the DNA, that is responsible for the biological activity of these uh, pathogens. Now, they could stimulate the modulatory cells and produce lactase. Sometimes uh, these probiotics could add via competitive execution, competition for nutrient and stimulation of a kind of a immune response. So a lot of other things. But in conclusion, before I go to the conclusion, we must know that we are still at the elementary stage compared to Euro. We can see what we saw yesterday about what people are doing. So if we could enhance the way we can reshape, rebrand this uh, essential beneficial microorganism like lattice acid bacteria, like uh, fingerprinting that will enhance the paper or molecular techniques to polymerase chain reaction, they could enhance to improve the food quality, most especially protomics, metabolic genomics techniques and multivariant approach to help analyzing data uh, will be indispensable. Secondly, there is a need for us to carry out a lot of uh, in vitro trial with this uh, biological active component for us to be able to establish uh, the head constituent of this. So it's very, very important. There is need for applied and translational research. Not that many good research are not being done at local level in Africa, but we need to upgrade what we are doing, where we are, so that we can repackage we need to embrace and engage in a kind of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach for us to work together to find the solution to the global problem. Now, we have no where we are going. We have the local resources here. And we need to uh, 
stabilize and upgrade our thinking that we need to use the local knowledge in resolving the local challenges. So thereby, we need to have engage in applied research and standardizing of the products is very important so that we'll be able to say at this particular amount of bouncing added to a product, it will extend the shelf life. We need to engage in some technology like nanotechnology, whereby we can have a kind of nano bounce sensor that will help in sensing uh, atmosphere around the farmers where we are that can lead to spoilage of this meat or fermented product. So there are a lot of other things like uh, artificial intelligence, internet of a team that could help us to have a kind of a robust uh, fermented product from Africa. It will even help us to standardize all this meat and uh, we must know that it is very important. Most especially when the whole world is going to uh, a lot of challenges. So in Africa, effort is aimed at financing food and egg potential of these fermented products. So you will not see reason why most of these Fulani X-Men, they don't get sick because this lecture has opened our eyes to see that there are a lot of essential nutrients like protein, vitamins, and minerals that could help the global, not even at Africa or South Africa, the global problem of food insecurity, double problem of chronic and infectious diseases. Now, there is need for, I've said about that, in fact, collaboration. And we need IAGL in this context to collaborate in terms of grants and so many universities in the UK, US, and over the world to collaborate with us. We have millions of bio resources that are wasted, millions of human resources, capacity. Now, let me talk quickly about COVID-19. How COVID-19 relates to fermented Africa food products. Because the whole world are in doubt and they have asked a lot of questions. Why is it that the level of COVID-19 in Africa is very low compared to so many regions in the world? We knew that COVID-19 spread around the world from the city of one city. So I don't need to go into literature, all of us know that. But why carefully searching for effective treatment? Now, some countries are just coming up with a lot of antibiotics. Now, in Africa, let me tell you people the secret. Let me tell everyone the secret. The secret is that some of these, uh, our fermented drinks, food products, has a lot of beneficial, nutritional, and a lot of prospects that could boost immunity. Like, you know, this viral disease, COVID-19, SARS virus, what it's doing is that coronavirus is that it works based on lowering your immunity. But taking all these fermented drinks products boosts, enhance the nutritional benefit and the health benefit. So it's very difficult for the virus to attach to the respiratory, to all other organs that are necessary for this infection can become enhanced. So you can see these fermented products, they are blessing from God. So in addition to clinical quality, they might also serve as probiotics that could boost a government. Now, let's quickly see as a scientist, somebody will say, how did they now work? Now, this derivative can suppress pathogen like coronavirus and all other respiratory or pulmonary viral disease, influenza disease, and a lot of other diseases. They could regulate immune system response and cause disruption of viral adhesion. Since viral could not attach, the process of cell replication and the circle will not be completed because this active biosyn that I've talked about and some other essential products and biological products could wash the uh, viral from attaching to the cell. And once attachment cannot occur, definitely COVID-19 disease cannot occur. So they could serve as something that could cause disruption of viral adhesion, which form number one mechanism. Number two mechanism is based on the fact that they are involved in enhancement of macrophage production that could boost the activity of pro-inflammatory cytokine. They could also help as a, and serve as a kind of anti-inflammatory activity by inhibiting activity of pro-inflammatory cytokinase, such like uh, IL-1B and uh, interleukin and a lot of 
other uh, biochemical factors that could stimulate enhanced uh, globally, hemoglobin, and could enhance the activity of white blood cell that could help in fighting against all these uh, pathogenic or uh, viral diseases. Number three, number four is that they constitute a lot of biological products and their byproducts who act as inhibitors that could form a kind of co cytokinin, which could be a viable policy. So, um, before I say this, let me say the last point is that they could lower COVID 19 mobility, which has been uh, exhibited by European countries because of the diet of food and at molecular entry point for COVID 19. Angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE2 form a kind of a mechanism that could also help in fighting coronavirus disease. So I could not say more, but just to encourage at this point, you can see a lot of benefits in terms of bioresources, circular economy, sustainable development goals being encompassing and being focused a lot of wasting natural resources. So if we can work together, identify all these gaps, work with the policymaker, scientists, researchers, needs to unmesh together now in order to solve the global problem. So on this point, I want to thank the IDAL for inviting me as a keynote speaker on this great occasion. I want to thank all the audience and everybody, and I want to appreciate the Vice Chancellor of Edo University uh, for producing a great scholar from this university and for creating a good platform for research and for collaboration. So I look forward, uh, our university look forward to collaborating with all of you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, very great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, although I'm conscious of time, please drop them in the chat function or the chat box below and then I will read it out. Okay, I think we move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker will be Professor Abalaka from the Department of Microbiology from the Federal University of Technology, MENA. Um, his presentation will be about enhancing the nutritional value of milk in rural areas of developing countries through processing. Professor Moses Abalaka is a professor of microbiology, as I said, and his research, inter his research interests are in food and industrial microbiology, pharmaceutical microbiology, plant and plant products research, industrial microbiology, nanotechnology, as well as bioprocess engineering. Professor Abalaka also works in the area of soil microbial engineering, and he has authored and co-authored more than 80 um, publications nationally and internationally, including four books. He has supervised successfully countless PhD students and master students, and he is a member of the editorial boards of various different journals of high impact on the well known um, leading publishers. Um, I want to thank Professor Abalaka and um, over to you. Thank you very much, Madrid, for having me. I want to believe that you are hearing me. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Well, I am Professor Abalaka, as I've been introduced, and uh, I'm here at this moment to present the paper titled Enhancing the Nutritional Value of Milk in Rural Areas of Developing Countries Through Processing. Uh, Dr. Charles, I think he had talked so much about uh, dairy products, and um, mine is just to be able to bring up the, how we can enhance the nutritional values of these uh, milk or dairy products through processing. And I would want to start with an overview. Milk, as we all know, is a daily product. Which is obtained uh, by, uh, I mean, from daily uh, dairy farming, and the dairy, dairy farmers have uh, this this farming as their, I mean, as often a source of their livelihood, uh, and it helps them to to alleviate poverty, 
and help them to take care of their families. For example, in, um, in Africa, we have Kenya, Nigeria, and the Savannah uh, grasslands, which are good examples of uh, where dairy, dairy farming is practiced here in Africa. In this study, we try to attempt to enhance, I mean, to, to show how enhanced, uh, how to, I mean, how enhanced nutritional value of milk can lead to improved diets in, uh, in our rural communities, as well as how uh, uh, dairy farming uh, contributes to, uh, to solve the unemployment problems, food security problem, as well as uh, underdevelopment in our rural communities. Now, according to Wikipedia, milk is a nutrient rich uh, liquid, which is produced from, uh, by mammals, from the mammary glands. And it's, it's, it's also a primary source of nutrient for young mammals. And um, especially in humans, we know that uh, humans breastfeed their infants uh, before they're able to take solids. So milk provides very good nutrition for mammal, I mean, for animals. However, it's not only uh, animals that produce milk as we'll see uh, much later. Milk is very rich in proteins, just like uh, Dr. Detiji said before. It contains uh, fats as well as carbohydrates. Uh, it, it contains uh, uh, carbohydrates in form, form of lactose. Uh, the, the nutritional components of milk uh, include energy, carbohydrate, fat, proteins, vitamins, some minerals, and uh, minor uh, biological uh, components like enzymes, uh, like lactoferrin, lactoperoxidase, lipases, and uh, lactases. These are some of the enzymes that are produced and uh, are found in milk. And uh, like I said before, apart from animals, which I mean, like uh, mammals, which produce milk from their mammary glands. Other uh, uh, plants also produce, I mean, uh, milk can also be uh, obtained from plants, like glycine max, glycine max, uh, soya bean, and the uh, Cyperus esculentus, um, that is uh, tiger nuts, have been used to produce milk in so many rural communities in Africa. Uh, especially in Nigeria where I live. And so apart from animals producing milk, plants can also be used to produce milk. But there is very striking difference between animal milk and uh, plant milk, just like you have difference between plant protein and animal protein. And um, organisms can, uh, different organisms consume uh, uh, milk from different species. Like human beings can consume milk that are produced by camel, goat, sheep, cattle, and sometimes even from pigs and dogs, they consume milk that are produced by these organisms. And by literature, we understand that about 6 billion human beings on the world surface consume milk. Now, there are various milk products that are available. Various milk products that are available. We have yogurt, which is a fermented uh, milk product, uh, fermented using the uh, bacteria species, Lactobacterium bulgaricus and Streptococcus hemophilus. These organisms are often added to milk as starter cultures. And these starter cultures, you, I mean, help in fermenting the milk, making milk to, I mean, converting the milk to yogurt, which has uh, striking characteristics different from the raw milk. Raw milk, yes, as we said before, contains its own nutrients, but the fermented milk also contains um, materials like organic acids, which are very useful to the health. They also contain probiotics that are very useful to health. So uh, yogurt is one of uh, the milk products. And also we have cheese. Cheese is another uh, milk uh, product, which is obtained by the interaction of lactic acid bacteria, lacto lactococci, 
lactobacilli, streptococci, uh, when they are added to uh, the milk. And uh, these organisms produce uh, enzymes such as chymosine, pepsin, lipids, and uh, give the characteristic taste to cheese when it is finally produced. Now, yogurt is most often ob obtained from cow milk, cow milk, although it can also be obtained from sheep, goat, water, buffalo, camel uh, milk as well. So it's not only cow milk that produces, uh, that can be used to produce yogurt. All the milk from other animals can also be used to produce uh, yogurt. Now, in making yogurt, making yogurt, naturally, I mean, what happens in making yogurt is the temperature of the milk is increased to about 80 degrees centigrade and allowed to boil or, uh, or boiling temperature. And then after it is cooled down, then the organism, is, uh, the organism mentioned a four times, lactobacillus, uh, 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 added uh, to the boiled and cooled milk when it is cooled to about a temperature of 45 degrees centigrade. These organisms are added and started culture, uh, cultures to the milk and it's well mixed and incubated at ambient temperature for a few hours, usually overnight. After the overnight uh, uh, incubation, then the, it, 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 it is now converted to yogurt, which is now uh, prepared in such a way that lumps are broken and then water may be added to thin if it is too uh, thick and then to become the final uh, uh, pro yogurt product. Then cheese is another ancient dairy product that is known that, uh, that is produced by the use of uh, milk, uh, lactic acid bacteria uh, when it's added to milk. And in making uh, cheese, the solids are separated from the whey by co coagulation with rennet. And these are enzymes obtained, enzymes like chymosine, pepsin, lipids, which are obtained and are then added to the, the milk in order to coagulate and separate the, uh, the milk from the way. This separation, um, uh, eventually, the coagulation of the milk and separation of the way leads to uh, the formation of uh, cheese, which is uh, used in so many ways. This is the way um, cheese, yogurt, are produced normally by the world. But in rural areas, which is my focus, milk and dairy products remain largely pro, uh, primitive. The production of yogurt, the production of cheese is primitive. It's not as I explained uh, a four time. It, it, it remains largely primitive in such a way that they use primitive ideas. They use their local ideas to produce uh, these, uh, 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 these milk products. So, and everything remains subsistence, I mean, subsistence in nature. And so we need to in, in, increase or improve on what is being done primitively in the rural areas in order to have greater nutritional values and output from the milk. Milk is continued to, to, to be produced in very many rural areas of the world, uh, especially in Africa and Asia, in a very primitive way. They, and these individuals depend on milk and the milk products for their economic gains. And also, uh, many of these rural communities are ravaged by poverty. They are faced by famine and already they have grimmer economic situation, hunger, malnutrition facing these rural dwellers. The coming of COVID-19 has exacerbated 
these woes we have in many African rural communities and in Asia. And I want to categorically say that many of these rural communities are facing an uncertain future. I mean, uh, future. If nothing is done, then we are going. We are facing catastrophe in Africa, rural. I mean, rural areas and in Asia. I want to remind you that nearly eighty percent of African population is living below poverty level. No matter whatever the leadership of these countries say, they live. More, nearly 80% of the population live in, I mean, below poverty level. And the rural areas are faced with grimmer future. Milk can be processed to obtain three things in these rural communities. I mentioned yogurt and cheese before, but in the rural communities of Africa and Asia, they also obtain oil from milk. So they have yogurt, they have cheese, and they have oil. Usually it comes in form of, uh, in form of uh, butter. Like in, in Nigeria here, the oil obtained from uh, cow, that is cow oil, is called mansion. And each of these products the yogurt, cheese, and oil add to the diet in this country because very many people depend on these products for their daily living, for their daily food, for their daily diet, they depend on this. And milking and processing of the milk remains manual. And in most cases, women are the ones that process this milk in the rural areas. Now, in the rural areas, rural, I mean, yogurt making is very rare. In Nigeria here, they don't make what they call, we call yogurt per se. What they make is called uh, no-no. And I'll tell you very briefly, as I continue, how they make this no-no. It is a form of yogurt. And usually the local people are the ones that produce this and mostly women. Now, the first step they do in making um, milk and the, product, the products for milk is they collect milk from the cows, from the sheep, from the camel in wide-mouthed basins, usually inside calabash. They allow it to stand for about eight hours. After this, the, the fat, the cow fat will congeal on the surface of the milk in the bowl or calabash. Then they collect this milk. I mean, they collect the, they collect the, uh, the, the, the fat, that is the oil, which they refer to as manchano here in Nigeria. They collect in a basin or in a bowl and keep aside. Then they, are, they are still left with the milk. Now, the milk that is left, they make cheese from it. The cheese here, they call it wara. Now, they make the cheese from the milk traditionally by adding coagulant from a plant called Sodom apple, that is Calotropis procera, to a fresh boiling cow's milk. And when they add this extract to it, it coagulates. The resultant uh, product is, um, a coagulated milk known as uh, casein and whey. The water can be eaten, you know, can be eaten very raw, just the way it is produced, or it can be fried. It can also be cooked with, and, uh, with spices and eaten as a delicacy. Most of the rural communities in East, West, North, and East, uh, West North Africa, as well as Asia, they use Calotropis procera for milk uh, curdling. Now that is for cheese. For the yogurt-like substance called nono, 
to make no no. Milk is collected from the cow or sheep or whichever animal and allowed to stand overnight for fermentation. The fermenting organisms come from the air or the utensils. So they don't have any special way of uh, adding certain culture. The fermenting organisms come from there because they expose the milk so obtained to the air. And microorganisms from the air collect on the surface of uh, the milk. And then the utensils which they use to, to make the no-no the previous time is also the same utensil they use without washing. Therefore, we believe that the organisms that uh, ferment the no-no or the milk to no, no no come from the air as well as the utensils. Lumps are formed after the fermentation. The lumps that are formed are broken down using, using wooden fork. The final product obtained, which is no no, has a sour taste and it can be taken raw or it can be mixed with a millet based cereal food called fura or it can also be taken by addition of sugar to taste. This is the delicacy that they take in these areas. There are some things we need to note from the production of these products. It is believed that the latex that is extra from the plant, Calotropis procera, helps in the congealing and formation of cheese from milk, as well as you know, uh, for some cheese. And then also, there is no deliberate introduction of microbial fermenters as certain cultures to the milk. They expose it to the air or uh, all the organisms from the utensils. That is what help in fermenting the milk to yogurt or the no no. And the, the, the three products obtained no no, wara, manshanu, all of these have characteristic, I mean, very, I mean, characteristic longer shelf life than the raw milk itself and also contain nutrients such as organic acids, probiotics, and the like. Now, this is the Sodom apple, the leaves and uh, the fruits of uh, Sodom apple, Calotropis procera. And this is my channel, the cow milk that is obtained from milk, my channel. And also, this is cheese obtained from the cow milk, wara. And then this is the, how they break the lumps. When no, no, uh, milk is fermented to produce no, no. This is how the lumps are broken with a wooden fork. And this is the final product, no, no, which can be taken just the way it is, or it can also be, uh, fura can be added in order to, um, to take it or they add sugar to taste. Now, how do we improve? How do we improve on the production of these substances? As well as, we need to educate these people. The, the process of production looks so primitive, unhygienic, but they consume these the way they produce. Therefore, there is a need to, to educate the rural women on the better way and more hygienic way to produce these important food materials. Also, these individuals, they need financial assistance from world bodies. We focus on indigent and poor rural dwellers in order to enhance their financial and economic status. And then we also need the provision of our, our availability of treated uh, portable water. You know, if you can provide them with customized bacteria filters for filtration of water after boiling, then the water used to prepare these uh, milk products can be thought to be saved and uh, to be safe. Then also, we can enhance the pro uh, provision of starter cultures instead of allowing uh, fusion from the air to ferment the milk 
we can uh, we, we can provide certain cultures just that we the way we have already produced the baker's yeast baker's yeast are produced in powdered form and they are sold almost everywhere in in the entire world if we can uh, obtain the starter cultures of lactobacillus uh, tomophilus i mean sococcus tomophilus uh, 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 lactobacillus and we obtain it in a powdered form and sold in the rural areas they can now obtain these starter cultures and use to ferment their milk instead of allowing it to uh, to be fruit i mean to be fermented from the air microorganisms from the air or from the utensils which may be, make it very unhygienic again packaging has been a very big problem the the, the hawk days in calabashes if we can introduce packaging you can introduce them to packaging a safer way to package the milk products in order to have uh, you know a uh, a, uh, a a packaged product that is safe and hygienic for consumption. Lastly, establishment of cottage industries by well-to-do individuals, people that have the know-how from other clients, like from the UK, from the Europe and the America, uh, other, I mean, individuals that are well-to-do, you can enter into rural areas, establish uh, cottage industries, to produce milk. Already the raw materials, which is milk, are available. They are available in these rural areas. You can, if, if you do so, you can help to, you, 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 you enhance the economic value of uh, these uh, rural dwellers because uh, they, 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 making use of cottage industries will add value. You know, there'll be value addition to the milk that, uh, they produce. In conclusion, I'd like to say that it is estimated that the world population will reach about 10 billion by 2020, and about 70% live in rural areas. Most population of the world are, are without adequate and accurate balanced diets. Milk could be a very good source of the modern diets by the world. Milk and daily, uh, uh, dairy making uh, take place in uh, for centuries that has assisted rural areas to improve their economic standards, reduce unemployment, and improve the health of the people over the years. However, the advent of climate change has affected these uh, people tremendously, leading to drought, and everything is also exacerbated with the coming of COVID-19 which has crippled so many businesses as well as the milk industry in the rural areas. The population cannot sustain themselves. The rural area suffer much more from this COVID-19 as a result of uh, uh, the problems, the grimmer economic situations they have had before now. And so the rural population, they can help, we can help to sustain the rural population maintain their health, improve on their, you know, uh, their livelihood, if we can harness the issue of our dairy product. This can be achieved through informal education of the farmers and those involved in the dairy making. And then we also need financial assistance you know, from the world body like the United Nations World Bank, provision of basic and amenities in the rural areas, and the use and improvement of uh, or are making available starter cultures and uh, to the uh, uh, remote areas. So dairy making the remote areas will certainly boost rural, uh, you know, uh, rural employment to a great extent. And this will make uh, uh, employment available to them. It will reduce unemployment. It will reduce violence. And apart from the above, it will also provide them with security against drought, disease, and hunger. If we do all this, then we'll be able to assist the world population. I would like to thank the Institution of Agri Engineers for the privilege given to me, and I also appreciate Dr. Daniel Hemp and Sarah McLeod for inviting me to speak. I acknowledge my 
co-speakers, especially Dr. Charles, and uh, who is my compactor here in Nigeria. And I would like to thank everyone of us for participating. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Abalaka. Um, very interesting talk. Certainly, I never knew that you can use that particular plant for curdling um, dairy. As far as I was aware, it's always some acid or some rennet. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will read it out then. Uh, Paul is asking, is the Nigerian market ready for the participation of an international dairy company at this time? In yes. India, for example, Nestle has put in considerable investment to produce a consumer available range of dairy products. Yes, I want, I want to emphatically say that Nigeria market is very ready, very, very open and very accessible. And there is easy, I mean, uh, easy way to make business in Nigeria. If you want to make uh, dairy business in Nigeria, we have, uh, you, you, can, you can contact individuals like, um, you know, like myself, like uh, Charles, we'll be able to guide you on how to be able to, to do this to the rural areas. We know most of these uh, areas. We know most of the people that produce this and we can uh, guide you through. We are really in need of collaboration. There is a, a lot of potentials here in this country that can give you enough in the dairy industry if you can uh, come up with it. And as many as want to contact us, you can contact us and we'll take you through. Thank you to professors Adetunji and Abalaka for that. Really, really interesting. Shows the diversity of the subject uh, of dairy, you know, especially compared to the, the subject we had yesterday, which was talking about advanced computer systems in livestock farms. Um, tomorrow we have uh, two gentlemen from GEA, um, Daniel Busman and David Simmons, who are going to talk about some of the equipment and processed equipment involved in dairy. So that should be really interesting as well. Um, because we have such a wide international audience, as I put in the chat function today, we do, if anybody is interested in membership of the institution, we do have uh, reduced rates for those from uh, developing countries and low income countries. So that's worth pointing out. Um, so uh, if there's anything else to say, uh, we'll draw the the, uh, the day to a close. We have overrun ever so slightly, but uh, thank you for those who have stayed with us. Um, and we might see some of you tomorrow for a, a different uh, pair of presentations. Okay, thank you.